happens when you mix together dungeon crawling, roguelite, and strategic JRPG elements with cooking and foraging while sprinkling it with some cutesy anime graphics you would most likely see from games like Persona Q and Etrian Odyssey? Well, you'd get Nippon Ichi Software's latest title, Monster Menu, The Scavenger's Cookbook. Now, as cute as the graphics may be, and they are cute monsters included, Monster Menu is not for the faint of heart and quick to rage, as even the easiest of its difficulty can prove to be a challenge for the uninitiated and unprepared. This What's up girls and boys? What's up internet? I am Bianca and it is my hope that this video will provide a good enough beginner friendly tips for those wishing to delve deep into these mysterious dungeons. So without further ado, let's begin. Tip number one, choose the difficulty that is right for you. Monster Menu offers several game difficulties right at the start of the game. There's easy, normal, hard, and nightmare. Each difficulty has their own perks and challenges, like having more variety of skills on Nightmare and a low experience multiplier to Easy's low enemy growth and high experience multiplier but low equipment skills. Whatever your choice may be, if you ever find it being too easy or too difficult in the long run, you can always switch the difficulty level around by heading to the options menu and choosing the appropriate difficulty setting that matches your palette. Pick the difficulty that you are more comfortable with for a more enjoyable experience. Having said that, even on easy mode, things can get difficult if you're not careful with managing your resources. Tip number two, take advantage of surprise attacks against enemies. As with most RPGs, SRPGs, and JRPGs, it is always a good idea to perform preemptive attacks by initiating battles while the enemy's back is turned. Not only will this ensure your party takes the initiative with attacks and start battle with the turn order in their favor, but will also make some battles a lot more easier to deal with. Remember that enemies can also make use of surprise attacks against you, so be sure to never turn your back on them. Tip number three, avoid scavenging and opening chests while enemies are present. It may seem enticing to open chests and scavenge for items whenever you see chests or those sparkly harvest points, and it may seem like an enemy may not see you or take notice, but chances are they will. And when they do, you will be in a precarious position of not being able to do anything with their ambush as the game doesn't offer the option to cancel harvesting or opening chests, nor does it provide a frame of invincibility while opening chests and scavenging for items. As a rule of thumb, scavenge and open chests only when you've made sure that no enemies are present. Same goes for harvesting the meat from your fallen foes, although you may want to hold on to that because of tip number 4, devour your enemies. Though it may seem like a good idea to chop off your fallen foes and obtain the meat for your cooking, there are times when devouring is a much better option especially when you're in the middle of a pretty good run with enough time to explore but not enough health, calories, or hydration. Devouring is an option you can do while in battle that lets you eat incapacitated foes on the map, provided the battle map happens to be where they have fallen. Doing so will replenish a bit of your HP, calories, and hydration. To do this, simply lure enemies into groups and, while in battle, have the desired unit that needs nourishment head for a fallen enemy and press the triangle button. This will call upon the menu of actions you can do while in battle, one of them being devour. Select that and watch as your unit munches and heals up. This is especially helpful when dealing with tough opponents like the Argon rulers, the bosses in this game, as they do come with a couple of mob units with them. Do note, however, that some enemies provide interesting buffs, like attacking twice once you devour them, while others give off negative ones like poison and paralysis, so try to steer clear of those monsters 
as delectable as they may seem. Tip number five, pick the best weapon. Like with Etrian Odyssey, Monster Menu offers character creation and classes that you can set up for each of the characters you make, the maximum of which is 4. Each of these classes have strengths and weaknesses as well as weapon affinities that you can check via their status and skill pages. As this is an SRPG, certain weapons have certain advantageous reach that keeps your unit safe while dishing off attacks, like the spears and bows, or powerful weapons at the cost of being up close and personal with your enemies like the axe and the broadswords. Learning how to balance these with the classes that you have can help them learn skills faster. That being said, there isn't really any restrictions as to what weapons a character can wield. For instance, I managed to get through the first two Orgons or Biomes with my Archer and Healer wielding spears and my Mage whacking enemies off with a Stone Axe since they also gain skill experience off those. There is just one thing you have to remember if you do end up using bows and that's tip number 6. Always have projectile items. One of the most annoying things I've found while having an archer is constantly monitoring the amount of arrows or projectile items you have in your inventory, crafting them when necessary, and equipping them when you do run out. Which is something I wasn't aware I should do, so I went on battles at a floor with my archer being unable to do anything, hence the whole reason he ended up having to use a spear in the first First place. So, one important tip I can give you is to always make sure you have crafted a lot of these projectile items or these arrows since your archer will use these arrows every time they attack. Note that there are no shops in this game, so you will have to make sure you have the materials to craft and that you will do so whenever you rest in your camp, which is what tip number 7 is about. Tip number 7, rest at camp. Monster Menu's dungeon design allows you to choose to rest whenever you see the stairs leading to the next floor. Resting does not have any downsides to it and you immediately end up in the next floor if you do so. When you rest, your HP will be replenished but the calories and hydration meters will go down. That's the reason why whenever you choose this option, you must also choose to actually rest first before cooking and feeding your party since doing the opposite will lessen whatever effects on your calorie count and hydration meter whatever food you prepared may have and with the scarcity of resources, that's not a good thing. Another thing to remember about cooking is that whatever food you cooked but didn't feed your party while you're at camp and you decided to leave camp and continue exploring will be discarded so only cook what you need and don't be wasteful. It is also a good idea to check your equipment and craft whatever needs crafting before you head off to the next floor. Personally, I tend to take two floors at a time before resting unless my calorie and hydration meters are low and my party needs nourishment. Tip number 8. Pay attention to the log notifications. Monster Menu has a log system that frequently updates with everything you do, whether that be using a particular attack on an enemy or leveling up, getting stats or statuses or removing those buffs, and a bunch of other useful notifications really. So apart from these notifications that these logs provide, they also update you on the freshness of your ingredients. If you are running low on them and are very deep into your dungeon spelunking, you may want to keep an eye out for these log updates so as to not get blindsided at the lack of fresh ingredients once you do end up back at camp. Remember that freshness equates to how much points you get out of a dish and that in turn has an impact on what buffs or debuffs you end up getting. Not to mention the actual amount of health, calorie, and hydration replenishments you gain from it. Tip number 9. Prep your food. 
One thing that can easily be missed in Monster Menu is the ability to prep ingredients, which can be found by selecting an ingredient in the inventory menu. This often forgotten option has its uses. Not only does it lengthen the ingredient's current freshness, but it can also add buffs and at times debuffs into it depending on what option you chose to do, of which there are four. Cut, crush, grill, and stir-fry. Tip number 10, keep it fresh. Speaking of freshness of ingredients as being a very important thing to keep an eye out for, never, under any circumstances, use rotten ingredients for food, no matter how dire the circumstances may be, unless you're trying to get that trophy that's related to you actually eating a poisoned food. <laughs> Rotten food denoted by the red freshness bar and flies, well, flying around it, only provides debuffs and can only ever provide a failed dish, which not only decreases your character's happiness, but barely, if ever, provides the necessary boost in your calorie and hydration meters. For your information, there are three freshness levels. Green, which tells you the food is at its prime. Yellow, which is the midway you can still eat it and get buffs level. And red for rotten. Freshness goes down quick though while you're out exploring floors, so again, check the logs for notifications about them. Tip 11, heal thyself. When you start off the game, the only person you can use in the tutorial dungeon is the character you make for yourself. And although it's a good idea to make your first character a tank or even the ever industrious and jack of all trades jobless class, you may want to think about giving them a healer class as well. Unlike other games where healers can be a bit of a weak fighter, I found in my own personal playthrough that they can stand on their own pretty well, especially when equipped with a sword or a spear. So the choice of starting out with a leader as a healer or creating one out of the three other characters is totally up to you, but you should definitely think about bringing one with you just in case. Tip number 12, avoid nighttime adventures. Monster Man you has a day and night cycle which impacts the strength of the monsters you meet with strong monsters coming out at night. As such, if you are not comfortable with fighting these strong monsters as they can easily yeet your entire party if you are not careful and are caught unawares by them, you may want to keep your dungeon traversals only until the clock which runs so fast in this game that it actually puts the ones from Story of Seasons to shame, strikes 6 p.m. as this is the moment that the monsters end up getting stronger. This is the reason why I suggest resting after two floors since I have found you can actually get two of them down before night strikes. Of course, if you are willing to risk it all, and I do mean all since dying will send you right back at the first floor of that particular Argon with all of your items and levels gone, then you may want to give these stronger monsters a try. Who knows, you might actually be victorious and net something worthwhile or not. Tip number 13, gain the upper hand in battle. Like with all SRPG titles, in particular to note the Disgaea franchise, there is a merit in ganging up against a single enemy unit in battle. Not only will you take down the foe faster, but you can also initiate chain attacks with the rest of your party. Chain attacks, depending on how many characters end up triggering it together, can give these nearby characters an extra attack. Another thing you can do to have the upper hand in battle is to attack the enemies at the rear and at the sides. Attacking them from behind can cause critical hits, while attacking them at the sides ensure that your attacks will not miss. Attacking from the front can sometimes work or it can miss, but the damage dealt is much comparatively lower than if you attack them elsewhere. Do remember that if you can do it, so too will the enemies and they will do it much more frequently, attacking you from behind when they are able. 
elemental damage is also a thing in this title and you may sometimes find equipment that gives a skill which imbues your attacks with a particular element. Depending on the enemies encountered at a specific Orgon, you may want to pick a different weapon. One that has no elemental properties as enemies with high affinity to the elements your weapon has will get lower damage from your attacks and you wouldn't want to prolong battles in this game. Tip number 14. Altars and Shards One of the things you will find in the dungeons are altars which provide buffs on you or sometimes your enemies like adding a level to them or adding more enemy spawns. You can make use of these altars so long as you have shards on you. Shards are dropped every time you win a battle and it is a good thing to keep as many of these in stock as altars are also the only means for you to revive your fallen allies. That being said, there is a limit to how many times a particular buff can be bought from them. For instance, revivals can only be done a total of 10 times. Apart from the Revival Blessing, a couple of useful blessings or curses I've encountered are the Quick Curse which adds an increment of 2% movement speed for each upgrade and Enhance which, as the name implies, enhances a wide variety of stats for each of your characters. Tip number 15, Weight Matters. Another gameplay mechanic available in Monster Menu is that dreaded inventory weight. Your weight in this game is determined by a couple of factors, including character levels and class. As with most games that have this mechanic in them, heavier inventory weight, especially those exceeding the limit, will make your character move slower. Surpassing that limit further will eventually keep your character from moving, making you prime picking for the monster mobs in these dungeons. So, as a rule of thumb, try not to get bogged down by the weight of your pack. Granted, you can still run, except when your movement has already been locked down by the weight of your inventory. Just a heads up though, there is a stamina bar for running and it is one that is very very quick to deplete. Tip number 16, repair your weapons. Another game mechanic available in this title is equipment durability, which is something that might be overlooked if you do not pay attention to it. Although how long your equipment remains durable is dependent on the rarity and the type, it is always a good idea to check frequently in the character status pages to see how they are doing. Should there be a need to repair your equipment, especially the legendary rarity ones, your only means to do so would be to craft repair kits as there are no shops in this game where you can readily buy one. It is also worth pointing out that you need one repair kit per equipment and not per character, which can be about 24 repair kits in total if you have all equipment slots filled. So yeah, that's a lot of repair kits. In the event that you do not have the necessary materials to make these, you can try to disassemble whatever equipment you do have and are not using. Note that disassembling equipment gives tons of materials, so remember to keep an eye out on your inventory weight. You can mitigate this by crafting other items like arrows for you and your archer. And lastly, tip number 17, save the fallen. Death is inevitable in a genre like this and with your party leader being the most important unit as their death will spell being sent back to the beginning with fewer items in your inventory, Keeping them healthy and safe should be a priority. As such, your allies may end up becoming cannon fodder. And although it is an eventuality you may not be able to escape, one thing you can do to ensure that you don't lose them and get some experience points from it is to keep their unconscious selves safe as enemies can and will still attack them even if they have already fallen in battle, much like how you can do it to them. So, as much as possible, should an ally unit fall, try to lure the enemies away from them and quickly end the battle. After which, don't forget to interact with whomever had fallen to bring them with you once again. Of course, you'll still need to find an altar to actually revive and use them again, but at least you didn't lose them forever. 
And that's it. That's all the tips I can share at this time, having gotten to the third Oregon at the time of this recording. Should I find or come across any other tips I can share with newbies to this game or to those people who are curious about this game but are feeling a little bit apprehensive about it, then I'll be sure to make another video to add them. Hopefully, I will be able to also publish the review for this game soon, what with all the things that's been happening and has happened in real life. Um, I'm kind of pressed for time, but we'll see. I'll try to post it as soon as I'm able, along with a bunch of other videos I have in the works. Anyways, that's all the time I have for today. I hope this video proves helpful at some capacity to anyone hoping to enjoy Nikonichi Software's latest title, Monster Menu, The Scavengers Cookbook, which will be released on retail and digital for the PlayStation 4 and 5 and the Nintendo Switch on May 23 for North America, 26 for the EU, and June 2 for Australia and New Zealand. Thanks to our friends from Nippon Ichi Software America for providing me with a review code to make this video and every other video involving this title moving forward. And thank you as well to everyone watching and who's watched this video. Until next time, you guys know the drill. Dream on, fly on. Bye bye for now. See you all soon. Monday,